sci-fi fan is going to just lose their mind over today's <laughs> interview. I have, I'm rocking my Star Trek insignia just because I knew that she was coming. Please welcome to the studio, Miss Julie Caitlin Brown. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good, Good to, to see, see you. you. Oh. oh my gosh, I'm so excited to finally have you on the show. I'm but very excited to be here. I know, here. And, and I just love like talking to you. You're like one of the most <laughs> interesting people I've ever met in my entire life. Oh, come Fantastic. on. No, I'm serious, really? I'm All serious. Right. So, you don't get out much then? I guess. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know Julie, uh, she's known for her appearances on Babylon 5. She's done two different Star Trek mm -hmm. series and guest starred in both of them. Nowadays, she is an empowerment coach, a triathlete, and a personal appearance manager. So wow, that's a lot of stuff on yeah. one resume. That's amazing. So you've had quite a career, but let's start with acting. So sure. how did you first catch the acting bug? I think I always knew I was going to act. I told my mom when I was five years old I was going to star on Broadway. Well, and, and I did. Very, wow, yeah. that's fantastic. What did you, what did you do? <laughs> well, um, I'm six feet tall and I don't dance, really, because I was in a back brace up to my neck and down past my bottom for three years in high school. Oh my gosh. So to all, everybody out there, you know, just because you have a challenge doesn't mean you can't have your dreams. You just have to work a little harder and don't quit. Yeah. So I um, sang and I didn't really act in uh -huh. high school because of the brace, mm -hmm. but I could sing. And then when I was 18, I got involved with a theater group and I just, I was just in heaven. I mean, I oh loved it. And my big dream was to be on Star Trek as well. I, I would fantasize about Captain <laughs> Kirk and stuff. And, you know, because I was a kid that was lonely. I didn't have a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. um, I was, we would not, we never called it bullying back yeah. then. You know, I, I was teased a lot and, and stuff. So um, Star Trek was one of those things that I loved to watch yeah. um, because I really felt that what Roddenberry was putting forward was a kinder, gentler world. Even though we still had challenges, if we all kind of banded together, we could surmount anything. Right. So um, sci-fi was always a big, mm -hmm. a big draw for me. I loved Asimov. I loved, um, you know, Fahrenheit uh, 451. <laughs> I was a huge, I loved to read science fiction. Oh yeah. Dug it. So what happened was I ended up going into musical theater and then I did commercials and then I did uh, some guest star work. Mm -hmm. And when I got to New York, my agent said, um, I have an audition for the national tour. I said, well, that's kind of like the next right thing for me. That's yeah. cool. Um, it's to play uh, a 42-year-old Italian lesbian. I was 29 and straight. <laughs> but she was a contralto and didn't have to dance much. And she oh. was a lead in a Tony Award-winning musical for Tommy Toon called Grand Hotel. Wow. And I went, well, hello. Yeah. So I showed up and I did one audition. And instead of offering me the tour, they offered me Broadway instead. So I did two years for Tommy Toon as Rafaela Otaño That's on Broadway. That's amazing. And when I came out of that, I kind of looked like this back then. These muscles were there. Mm -hmm. So, because I was, you know, I was all covered up so I could work out and whatever. Right. When I got to Hollywood, I'm six feet tall. They were like, yeah, you're going to play aliens. And I went, <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, that's okay. And then they said, yeah, but you're going to play it in full prosthetic makeup. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, but it, it was a dream. Right. It was a dream to me to go on Star Trek. Right. So my first one was Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. And I played Vekor in um, The Gambit, part yes. one and two. Uh-huh. Worked with Patrick Stewart and everybody. Just, just loved it. Aerosmith came to the set. <laughs> I have pictures as a sandwich with me and Robin Curtis and, 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 yeah. Are you in full prosthetics? Totally. Yeah, and they were like... such geeks. <laughs> they absolutely jumped on the transporter pad. We couldn't find them. And we're like, where are they? And they were, beam me up, Scotty. I mean, they were all into it, man. You know, it's like my... That's awesome. Yeah, I love that you like, never know who's going to geek out over what. It's fantastic. When we all have something yeah. that's in us that like connects to these characters. It's well, fantastic. Well, when Tyler... Um, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry sort of had a falling out. Yeah. They did an interview, and guess what his metaphor was about what was happening no, to him I, and I've Steven Tyler? What? Well, you know the episode where Kirk goes down and he gets split yeah. in the transporter, and it's sort of his weaker, kinder self, and then his really strong yeah, self. Yeah. That was the metaphor Steven Tyler used to explain what it was like to not be paired up with Joe Perry. Oh my gosh. Wow. I was like, you're like, okay. You're like, I understand that. Serious I geek. know what it looks like. Like, oh, I love that. It was perfect. And then I did Deep Space Nine. Actually, I'm sorry. Let me, I, I did that wrong. I did Deep Space Nine, 
the passenger first. I played Tai Kajada. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Star Trek The Next Generation. Then I went and played Natath on Babylon 5. Yeah, that's amazing. And that was the full, hello. Yeah, so I mean, you kind of covered this question already, but what was it that led you to pursue science fiction? Like even back when you were just reading it, what, what was it that helped you connect to those characters? My mother was an English teacher oh. and Fahrenheit 451 was one of her favorite books. Mm -hmm. Um, also, um, The Wizard of Oz. And when people don't realize is, you know, because we saw the movies, we didn't really understand. The Wizard of Oz was also a fantasy tale mm -hmm. that had a lot to do with metaphysics and, and sort of a little bit of science fiction in mm -hmm. the sense that you're traveling to another place. Mm -hmm. It's magical. You know, you're outside your normal realm mm -hmm. of your everyday life and you can make things happen. Mm -hmm. And that just really appealed to me. Yeah. And, and I think that that sort of informed reading more about science fiction than watching science fiction. Mm -hmm. I loved, you know, Alien was one of my favorite movies. Um, Coming I'm not up big... on an anniversary too this year. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I represent um, uh, Veronica Cartwright and, and Tom. That's amazing. My Tom. <laughs> Tom. So I, uh, to me, it was always about good writing. Yeah. So when I worked with Joe Straczynski, the part was tough because the makeup was hard, mm -hmm. but the characters were so well written right. and so deep and he had something to say. And I found that in science fiction, most writers are looking at our society and they're making a comment. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And that absolutely. to me was important that the work that I did actually wasn't just entertaining, but it was also thought provoking. Oh yeah, that's what that's I think why everyone in this room loves science fiction as well because yeah. we're looking at the world in an idealized way, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic to to see what people come up with in that sense. Yeah. So on the more practical side, what was it like being on the set of Star Trek? <laughs> you know, um, for Deep Space Nine, it was the first year, oh. and if anybody's ever thought about it, mm -hmm. um, people ask me all the time, what's the difference between Paramount? and you know, Star Trek mm -hmm. and Babylon 5. Well, mm -hmm. Babylon 5 was done in a converted juice factory. Oh my God, out I in didn't Sun know Valley. that. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Wow. So we, I went from like the creme de la creme where you walked in to a, a warehouse mm -hmm. that had racks and racks of costumes. And by the way, everyone has boobs in space, but you have no nipples, okay? <laughs> I just wanna say that. You, there's no nippleage in space and you always have to wear a padded bra. <laughs> You're gonna be at least two cup sizes bigger in space. <laughs> That's good. That's, okay, good that's to what know. you need to know. Yeah. And um, yeah. And uh, so you had this very, you know, we're Paramount, and you know, you had your trailers, and it was all very shishi. And then you go to Babylon Five, where it's like, oh God, dark down and dirty in the dark. You go in in the dark, you come out in the dark. Um, it was a long drive. I lived in Manhattan Beach, and oh, I'd be no. getting up at like two thirty in the morning to get to set by three thirty, make up at four a.m. <gasps> Three and a half hours of makeup, shoot till seven, get the makeup off, yeah. go home, learn your lines, go to bed at 10 and be back up at 2.30 in the morning. That's why I couldn't stay on the series. Wow. It was just prohibitive. Yeah. But Star Trek in itself, the first season, you're meeting, you know, all of these wonderful actors. Mm -hmm. I knew Terry Farrell. Mm -hmm. But they don't know each other. Right. So it's like first day at school and you're going, oh God, you know, who's like in charge and what's <laughs> going on and, you know. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 yeah, Avery Brooks had hair. Oh it was God. really <laughs> disturbing. I mean, he had hair. And you're like, okay, you don't look like yourself. And then when they finally let him shave mm -hmm. and get his, mm -hmm. you know, hair going here, yeah. he, he sort of became the cool guy again. Yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> That's so crazy. You can't play a captain. But, but then, yeah. you know, going on to Babylon 5, mm -hmm. we were all in it together. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. You're like, it's us against the world. And then when I did Star Trek The Next Generation, I was in the last season. Mm hmm. So, so everybody had already. Like, they were like, "Yeah, man, how you doing?" Like, well, uh, you know. So it was it coming was, into like a family. Totally. Yeah. Um, and watching Jonathan Frakes and Patrick Stewart interact, because in this in the scene, uh, Patrick had to hit Jonathan, mm -hmm. and he kept going, "You know, I don't think I got that right for camera. Let me do it again. <laughs> I'm just going to do it one more time. Just hang on." Ah, you know. <laughs> and then was very Jonathan's funny. like known for only wanting like what he he has like that two takes Frakes like that that nickname. <laughs> Well, you know, it, prior to him wanting all that, that's crazy. Well, he let like, it oh, happen because it was he let it happen because it was it was yeah. Patrick. But <laughs> it was the same thing with Andreas Katsoulis and uh -huh. I. 
We would walk onto set after three and a half hours of makeup mm -hmm. and doing all of our lines together mm -hmm. all morning long, and we'd go, shoot the rehearsal. It's not going to get better. Just shoot. <laughs> oh We're God. ready. Yeah. So we became we became known as Martini, <gasps> which means Martini up. We're in the last shot. Oh, my God. Like, that's we can amazing. get this done. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Um, wow. So then how did you transition into being a personal appearances manager from all of this? When I was 21 years old and I had my first son at uh, 22, I had started at an agency in Northern California. I had friends who owned rock and roll clubs. So I was booking um, some good old fashioned rock and roll bands, jazz groups, and high level comics mm. like Dana Carvey and Barry Sobel and Paula Poundstone and wow. yeah, Bobby Goldthwaite, the Bobcat. Yeah. And, and I learned how to be an agent from them. And I managed four nightclubs, seven nights a week entertainment. And then when I got divorced and went to Florida, I taught a commercial workshop for acting and I went through the whole process of contracts. Mm -hmm. And what, how do you behave on set and what do you do? Mm -hmm. And so when I started doing Babylon 5 and in 1994 they took me to my first conventions, mm -hmm. I went, oh dear, this is like a flea market with actors and nobody knows what they're doing and nobody has any protocol, there's right. no contract. It's well, take what you make, and it's like, um, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> so I took the acumen I learned as a booking agent for these bands mm -hmm. and comics, and I married it to the Screen Actors Guild contract, and I started booking three of my fellow Babylon 5 actors yeah. and myself. <gasps> That's awesome. And that was in 1997, and now we have 65 clients, and I've been doing it 23 years. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah. So um, you have... Just so we can do a little bit of a shout out to some of your major clients. Who, yeah. who are you currently booking right now? Okay, well, I'll start with the big boy. I, I rep Jason Momoa, Lana Perea, Rebecca Mader, Mark Shepard, uh, oh Ben Browder, um, uh, Jewel State, Katie Sackoff, um, David Ramsey, Mark Pellegrino, uh, Elena Huffman, oh my God. Uh, David Hayden Jones. I have a lot of people yeah. from Supernatural. Um, Jim Beaver, I've got <laughs> like, uh, Tom like... Scarrett, Veronica Cartwright. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Tapping, um, Rachel Luttrell, Joe Flanagan, oh my gosh. David Hewlett. Um, let's see. I, I just signed Alexander Draymond, who's oh from uh, First Kingdom. Yeah. I have, um, <laughs> oh my gosh. I have, uh, well, she just got on two new series. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking now. She got on Legacies, and now she's on Fear of the Walking Dead, Karen David. Oh my God. Who's brilliant from Gallivant and Once Upon a Time. Yeah. Uh, Jared Gilmore from Once Upon a Time. Um, I mean, I, I have 65 of them. I'm yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure. But, that's amazing. But we have a lot of fun. We that's have a lot of so fun, fun with these people. Yeah. And that's so cool. And so you you go to a lot of conventions with them. Do you have yes, a do. favorite convention that you attend? You know, um, every convention is different. There's five different oh. kinds of conventions. Oh, so yeah. you've got your big corporate conventions that are run by people like Reed and Wizard and, uh, you know, San Diego Comic Con mm -hmm. um, and Forma. Um, then you have your standalones, like a San Diego Comic Con, mm -hmm. Dragon Con. Yeah. Uh, you have your charity events. Um, you have your guys like Salt Lake City Comic Con. And I want to say this right now. I keep saying the word Comic Con, and there's this big brouhaha out there right now <laughs> about the words Comic Con. Right. Comic Con means any event where you come together to honor comic books or the genre. Mm -hmm. We've all known that for 30, 40 years. Yeah. It's not a trademarkable, in my opinion, it's not a trademarkable name. So when I use the word Comic Con, I'm talking about a specific genre of events, right. not you know, saying San Diego Comic Con. Right. It's what comes in front of that that yeah. denotes ownership. So I just yeah. want to be clear that when I say the words Comic Con, I'm not infringing on anybody's trademark, because it really isn't one. <laughs> Um, in my opinion. Just to be clear. Just to be clear. I don't want, I don't want to get angry emails from people. Um, so for me, the best Comic Cons come down to, I'm going to say it, where they are as mm. much as what they are. Because I deal with 200 events around the world. Right. We're all over the world. I've had the pleasure of opening up the first shows in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, in Russia, wow. uh, in Brazil. Um, the Australian shows are great. Um, I think that in terms of fandom, I think Creation Entertainment um, does a great job in terms of that private kind of high barrier of entry because it's, it's, it's really a very special show. You, you have a lot of face time with your fans. Um, I think that in terms of getting out there and, and giving the fans what they're looking for, Wizard and Reed do a great job. Informa, um, you know, they're just, they've, they've bought some great properties. Mm -hmm. So I think Inform has been very strategic and very smart, but in terms of like there's like Dallas is a great show for 
Dallas Expo. Yeah. Um, I love Salt Lake City. Uh, I've enjoyed um, the European shows. Uh, they just treat you so well, yeah. you know, when you come over and it's just 2,000 fans or less. Wow. Yeah, these are small shows that... Um, that in makes fact, me I'm going to, go to, to Europe for Star a show. Fury. Star Fury does a great show in England. Um, PeopleCon in France. Love them. Uh, Josin Bello in Rome. Uh -huh. uh, we're going to a new one in Milan with Kinetic Vibe. We're very excited about wow. that with Once Upon a Time. That's exciting. Yeah. Oh my That's gosh. Good stuff. Yeah. <sighs> That's like a whole lot. And then also that... It makes me want to go to conventions and like you're, I've never been to a convention outside the U.S. So I'm you should go. They're destination uh, vacations now. Yeah, and uh, the I Australia know. shows for Reed are fantastic. Is that uh, the Supernovas? No, that Supernova is a different one. Okay. Reed, okay. Reed bought um, uh, DCA had been oh, doing okay. their shows. Yeah, the yeah. Hub. Uh -huh. They yeah, still yeah. do the private mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. The more you know, right? Two thousand yeah. pounds max. Mm -hmm. But they sold to uh, Reed, oh, and they do a nice job too. Oh, interesting! Very cool. So, in case you are ready, weren't completely amazing with all of this, you are also an empowerment coach yeah. to uh, inspire people to reach their personal potential. Can you talk a little bit about what that entails? Well, because I came from uh, having a challenged youth yeah. with the back brace, mm -hmm. and I really was afraid of people. I didn't really understand how to connect. Um, the music helped. Yeah. Singing. When I sang, I was a different hurt person, and that's kind of why you want to. I wanted to look at acting, right. because I wasn't really happy with who I was. I didn't really have a lot of support growing up, and, and a shout out to my parents who are still there. Don and Judy, love you dearly. You had six kids. Um, you know, I was sort of. I had to figure it out. Yeah. You know, you were busy. You know, keeping the roof over the head and the food on the table. I had to figure it out, and uh, I think what happened was through my travels in fandom. As I began to find people to relate to and I began to understand, wow, I'm not alone. Yeah. This isn't just happening to me. There's lots and lots of kids out there and young people that are struggling with this. How do I connect? Right. And so I wrote these books called Love First. And then I began to do Love First in Business, Love First in the Artist, and uh, going out and speaking to different groups. And it's just been really rewarding. And then I recently had a challenge with a third uh, concussion. I was at a, an event in Puerto Rico. I'm not going to tell you which actor I was with. And I went down a rock slide and I hit my head. Oh no. And um, I started having migraines. I started having anxiety, depression, um, hyper thoughts, couldn't stop the thoughts. Yeah. And for the last three years, it was really a challenge. And I found in last um, February, uh, my sister, who's an RN, said, Have you ever watched Dr. Daniel Amen on these TED Talks? I said, No. He, she said, Watch it. So he has what's called a SPECT scan, mm -hmm. and he um, has clinics, and we did, I decided to do a documentary yeah. called Noise, mm -hmm. and because I was already a motivational speaker, and I kind of had this information already, but now the physiology of my brain right. was compromised, mm -hmm. so the blood flow was not there. We have a physiological brain, we have a psychological brain, and if your physiological brain is compromised with... Um, this is very science fiction, oh, by the way. Yeah. If it's compromised and you're not getting the blood flow, then it can't help you manage your psychological issues. Wow. In your temporal lobes, in your frontal cortex, in your basal ganglia, in your thalamus, wow. which is where anxiety, depression, and things like this reside. Your physiological brain is challenged to help the psychological brain, and that was what was happening to me. So when I went in and I did the scans, they showed me, which was awesome. Yeah. It's so geeky. Wait till the film comes out. It's like super geeky. The, the, the thing that they put you on, uh -huh. that they wrote, oh my, it, it, I was like, this is like Star Trek. Oh, you're you like, know. this is real life. Seriously. Oh my God. And then, then no drugs. It was uh, some supplements, which mm -hmm. I won't talk about here because I don't want to push right. forward that. Right. It was, I did some hyperbaric chamber stuff, mm -hmm. also very sci-fi, where you go in and you push oxygen into the brain at 100%. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is very sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And then it was the meditation, which I did, and it was also your diet. And then they realized I was taking thyroid meds and I had too much. Mm. Because now that I'd become a triathlete, I didn't need so much. Mm. And once we made those adjustments and I did something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, also very sci-fi, yeah. where they open up your neural pathways after testing you to see what's going on in your brain through your optic nerve, which is connected to your cerebellum. Mm -hmm. It's the only organ that's directly connected. If your eye jumps when you're looking at these cards, it says that basically there are certain parts of your neural pathways that aren't functioning right. Oh my gosh. 
and this comes out of your imprinting from zero to seven when you're, yeah, if yeah. you're not imprinted correctly by your parents, you'll just make it up, you'll survive. Yeah. Well, the, the trauma to my head sort of kicked that into hyper gear. Oh my God. And when I did the transcranial meditation or a mag, uh, stimulation and I did the supplements, uh -huh. the triggers were gone. <gasps> Wow. I have my objectivity back. I mm -hmm. have emotional intelligence back. I just make my decisions now. I don't agonize over those decisions. Oh my gosh. And it's like a light switch went back on in my brain. That's I, incredible. I have to say that if you are struggling with depression and anxiety, please reach out to a professional. But if you really want to see what I'm doing in this documentary, go watch a Daniel Amen TED Talk yeah. and then go to amenclinics.com. Uh, you can also go to Straight Up Health. Uh, straight up SF, I'm sorry, dot com and look at uh, Maria Kish, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kish. Wow. She does the transcranial magnetic stimulation. There are answers out there mm -hmm. and there's help. That's, it's amazing. That's incredible. And yeah. then what is your documentary called so they can keep a lookout for it? Noise, because I couldn't shut the noise off in my head. Oh my God, that's <laughs> that's so perfect. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. so perfect. Yeah. Like, yeah. Let's I, turn off the noise for a while. Yeah, just a little bit. So we have some questions coming in from the Ooh, audience sure. if you'd like to take some of those. I'm ready. Um, and if you guys haven't asked your question yet, we would love to have you guys join in yes. the conversation with Miss Julie Caitlin Brown. So, um, First question is, Do you did you watch Twilight Zone? And do you have a favorite episode? I watched Twilight Zone in the Bill Mooney uh, episode, oh. which was freaky because I ended up on Babylon 5 with yeah. him. That was one of my favorite episodes. That's amazing. Yeah. And then how did, and then this is my follow-up, how, how did that feel to like watch someone in such an iconic show mm -hmm. and then to know that you are now their contemporary and their peer? What was funny is that <laughs> I walk in and I got the job on Babylon 5 because the actress ripped the makeup off her face at 5 in the morning and the, and the casting director called me at home. So I went in and they said, you have to do a makeup test and I sit down and there's Bill Mooney. <laughs> and Billy looks at me and he goes, yeah. They didn't tell me about these prosthetics either. I went, really? They go, no, they sent over a picture. I had no idea. So we're both going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my so God. You guys Can went we through do something this? together. We totally you had like a moment. This. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay, well, we're in Ow. this together. Like, yeah. let's hold hands. We let's did. do this. We did. And that's we're both crazy. Aquarians and we're both musicians. And I booked him for a while too. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. It was really so funny. there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. It was great. That's awesome. Um, and then this is actually a really good follow-up to this. Uh, does Julie find acting behind full prosthetic makeup, e makeup easier or harder? Physiologically, it's harder mm -hmm. because your your skin can't breathe. And when yeah. I was ba on Babylon 5, the only thing exposed to air were my lips. <gasps> oh, wow. Everything was covered. Oh, my God. So you go into oxygen deprivation. And so you have to be really, you know, pop the lenses out at lunch, take your gloves off. You, you've got to get yeah. your, your skin breathing, go outside in the fresh air. Mm -hmm. um, but I do find being behind a mask, it's mask work Yeah. from the theater. One would, you know, because you can't really rely on facial expression. Right. Now they would anchor it here, 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 so that I could express. Yeah. But the way that I would show you that I was thinking is I would have to do this. So you'd yeah. see my eyes move so uh -huh. that you could see that there was a process going on. Because otherwise, yeah. you couldn't tell what I was thinking and right. it would be very stony. Yeah. Yeah. So that was freeing because I could really, you know, disappear into the character. That's true. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, disappearing into the character mm -hmm. and then that way you, there's no like, oh, that's me. Oh, if you had a pimple, who gives a shit? Yeah, that's true. I'm sorry I said that wrong. No, way. that's yeah. totally fine. <laughs> totally fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so, Julie, are you going to be in any upcoming conventions in Europe, specifically Belgium or France from Jacqueline wants to know. Oh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Um, I am going to France. I'm not going to Belgium. Uh, I think you're talking about the Once Upon a Time event. Yes, mm -hmm. I will be in Paris. I will be in Milan. And then in the summer, I will be with uh, Lana Perea, Jason Momoa, uh, Joe Flanagan, Katie Sackoff, uh, in London Film and Comic Con. Oh my God. Which is also a great company called Showmasters I've worked with for years. That's awesome. Yeah. I've heard about that show and I've heard it's like a fun show. They're very fun and yeah. they're very low barrier of entry. So a lot of times it's free entry or very nominal really? and it's a la carte spending. So you just spend the money on what you want. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. They get some great awesome. clients. They get That's some really great. good people. Um, so then Michael Lampkin wants to know, Julie, being a triathlete, what are some of your proudest athletic accomplishments? Okay. This is really funny. I hadn't been in a pool in 40 years. I hadn't been on my, like a road bike in probably 
25 years and I never ran. Okay, this is a shout out to one of the founders of, of, to Greg, the founder of this company. You'd be surprised at what you can do if you just start. So Thomas Rowe, who um, is a, a buddy of mine and a really dear friend, is a triathlete and he didn't start till he was in his 40s. So he started training me and we started boxing and um, he got me running on an arc trainer because I was worried about impact because of my back. And then I found uh, another shout out to Orange Theory and their treads are really good. And once I got a good pair of shoes, I said, you know what, I think I, I think I can do this. So last year, after kind of a year of warming up to it, mm -hmm. that June I jumped in a pool and then I got on my bike and bought a road bike and then I ran like my first mile last, fe not this February, the February before. I hadn't even run a mile. And I decided to do a classic triathlon. Oh my God. I was like, okay, this is insane. I'm gonna get in a wetsuit and jump in the ocean. Uh -huh. so, I, <laughs> so I got into the ocean for the first time in the wetsuit, had a flat out panic attack. And oh the surfer God. went, get on your back and breathe. You're gonna be fine. Well, kids, I trained and I trained and I got to that race, and out of 26 women in 55 to 60, 55 to 59, I placed fourth and got on the podium. <gasps> nice. That's amazing. And then I did the Dipsy Trail Run, which is seven and a half miles. It's three miles straight up on a trail with obstacles, a mile flat, and then two and a half miles down, mm -hmm. which is harder than you think. And I placed first in all the women over 45. <gasps> and then I did the Catalina race, which is all hills. Oh my God. It's like three loops of up a mountain, like three and a half miles straight up on your bike. And then you run hills and I play second. <gasps> so in my first year, I qualified for the nationals in the sprint triathlons in Ohio and I'll be there this year. That's amazing. Congratulations. That's so cool. Oh my gosh, I so, love yeah, that. I'm very so excited. then that's so inspirational. So it's like, just do it. Just start. Just start doing it. And there's great equipment now and there's great ways to modify and the sprints are only, you know, it's a 750 yard swim mm -hmm. or maybe 850 and then it's uh, a 5k and then it's and then it's like usually a 12 mile bike. It's not that taxing. Mm -hmm. It's really just uh, the ocean swims that yeah. people freak out. Yeah. But I went back with it. Let's just go. Like, just do it. Just do it. Wow. Um, <laughs> Julie, do you ha have you ever collected any of the figures for the people that you rep? Yes. Yes. I have a closet full of pops of Jason Momoa in all of his incarnations from Aquaman and Kyle um, Drogo. And Kyle Drogo. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I yeah. love it. And you're going to obviously need the big, beautiful Jason Ooh. premium format. Apparently, I'm getting one because oh I had God. to give I had to give them artwork to do it because yeah. they couldn't get any artwork. So we had pictures from Jason, and so we we supplied that to oh Sideshow, and so amazing. they're giving me one. That's so exciting. cool. Um, yeah. and this is a fun. This is a fun question. Who's your, who is your Star Trek captain? Like, who is your favorite Star Trek captain? You know, it's so it's such a toss up between Jean Luc and. Um, Captain Kirk only because they're very different captains. They're such different captains. They're very different captains. For me, I think that, and I used to rep Bill. Yeah. And I want to say about Bill, his captain was so human. Oh, yeah. Was so filled with, and what he did so beautifully is when he was given the opportunity to show his frailties, to show his vulnerabilities, he, he did it in such a beautiful way. What I loved about Jean-Luc's, uh, you know, Patrick Stewart's portrayal, is that there was this sense that this is not a, a, a I think he's a very sexy man. Agreed. Um, I do. And, <laughs> Agreed. And, and, but he was not this movie star good looks like Bill had. Right. But what he had was this tremendous ability to instill calm. Yes. There was something about his leadership you know, and I know Bill had it too, Yeah. but I like them for different reasons. Yeah. Um, if it had to be hands down, it's gonna be Bill. Okay. I, I go with Jean-Luc because exactly what you said, the ability to instill calm, I knew that if Jean-Luc was around that I would be okay. Yep. So that was- Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I also continuously struggle with the Kirk Picard thing because Kirk mm -hmm. is such, an they're, amazing captain. And they're very different. And they're so different. Like, you can't even really compare them. No. 
because no. of how they both you couldn't put them in the same situation and have it handled the same way. It would, it would be, be handled completely, completely differently. differently. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, but I understand that. That's yeah. Good. Um, Nina wants to know: Is there a book recommendation that you have because it very much inspired you? For what kind of book though? Yeah, I was like, what? Yeah, it inspired me I to guess, what? Yeah, to, to to act, to write, to I think sing, she's to looking for, for some inspiration. Yeah. Okay, so you can go get my books, Love First. Uh -huh. ah, let's self-promote. Love uh -huh. First, The Beginning, Love First, and The Artist um, are out on uh, audio. You Ooh. can go to my website, juliecaitlinbrown.com. Um, if you're looking for things about brain health, uh, you can go to the Amen Clinics, and they have some wonderful books. It really, really helps you understand how your brain works mm. because I think that's the biggest uh, problem is that psychiatrists treat a, an organ they don't look at. Mm. Think about it, you know, cardiologists look at your heart and, mm. you know, but but they don't actually look at your brain. So yeah. that's what Dr. Amen has done. Um, in terms of acting, um, well, writing, there's the art of dramatic writing. I found that book incredibly inspiring. I'm working on my first Broadway musical. Uh, I have all the rights to, I can't tell you, it's a jukebox musical inspired by a big band in the 60s and 70s. And I can't tell you who... But I will tell you that I have oh all the licenses God. and we're looking at doing a workshop this spring, <gasps> which I'm very excited. That's so exciting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Gonna go back to Broadway as a creator. All right. Oh, that's so excellent. Yeah. Like and full circle. Full circle. And then uh, in terms of just, um, I, I think, I'm trying to think what other book, uh, Gary Zukov. Gary Zukov, Seed of the Soul. Those books are brilliant. Um, you know, anything by Wayne Dyer. In terms of metaphysical, um, we really do have more power than we like to give ourselves credit for, yeah. and we are a co-creator of our universe. So, just remember that you know this right here is 99% our issue. Yeah. We have to be able to see and envision our life before our life can manifest. And absolutely, and just know this: if you don't like your life, you need to look at where you're looking because it's like riding a bicycle. Where are you going? Where are you looking? Okay. So oh my gosh. At? Well, that that is actually a perfect, perfect way to kind of close off the yeah. show. So oh, thank you so much, Julie, for thank being you. here. I really much, I very Love much it. appreciate it. Oh my God, you're so fantastic and so inspiring.